Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go, do likewise. I want to take a few moments today, and on this Easter Sunday, I want to conclude our collection on our theme, Friend of Sinners, and I want to preach to you this message simply titled, Welcome to the Neighborhood. Welcome to the neighborhood, and I think it's going to encourage you. And So would you pray with me now, whether you're in the balcony or on this ground floor? Let's pray together. Let's believe the Holy Spirit's going to do what I can't do. Lord, we thank you so much that you brought us here. We thank you for your word, which is alive and active. It changes us from the inside out. Today, Lord, we didn't come to spectate. We came to participate. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to us now, change us from the inside out. May we never be the same. Today, we celebrate your resurrection. Thank you, Lord for coming for us. We love you. We praise you. And if you believe it, all of God's people said? Amen. All of God's people said? Amen. Come on, 1215, if you love Jesus, make some noise. Well, if you're new to Voo Church, uh, you might not have heard the news yet, but um, my wife and I, we went on an eight-year journey, really, of infertility. And 10 weeks ago this Tuesday... Uh, God brought us our miracle, our firstborn son. Come on, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. You just, you just saw a little bit of, of the video of Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. That's, that's a strong name right there. WWW, those are some initials right there. World Wide Web, yo. And I've been reflecting the last 10 weeks because there's so many things I love about being a dad. But I think right now my favorite thing about being a dad is the walks that I take with my son. In fact, we have a little bit of a, a tradition going on right now that every day that I'm home, uh, before sunset, I take Wyatt on a walk. In fact, now these walks are called the Wyatt Walk. <laughs> and it's amazing. And maybe some parents out here already kind of know about this. But, like, it's amazing how babies attract people. People love babies. Like, you get out there with a stroller, and, like, people just come out of nowhere <laughs> to meet you, to greet you. In fact, if you're here today, and you're struggling making friends, <laughs> I would encourage you to invest in a stroller. <laughs> you could put a blanket over the stroller. You could walk it down the street. People will come to you and say, is there a baby in there? You can say, no, he's sleeping. <laughs> yes, you lied, but I guarantee you just made a friend. <laughs> it, it just, people love babies. And my wife and I, we've been married for uh, 11 years. And uh, ever since, thank you, ever since we uh, lived in Miami, we, we've always lived in apartments. Um, just apartment living has kind of been for us. But uh, right before we discovered that we were pregnant, we uh, decided to move into our first house down here in Miami. And so we're living uh, in a neighborhood now. And I gotta be honest with you, I love my neighborhood. Like, every day I go walking, the people in my neighborhood are the nicest people I have ever met. I'm like, are we really in Miami right now? 
People walk up to us, they approach us, they share their story, they ask us about our story. I'm just telling you, person after person, they come, they greet us, and they always say the same thing at the end of the conversation. Well, welcome to the neighborhood. And as soon as they say that, I instantly feel completely accepted. I go, I belong here. This is my home. This is my neighborhood. I love, I love all my neighbors. Well, not all. <laughs> Recently, we discovered that our next door neighbor is an Airbnb. What a blessing. <laughs> From rap videos to bachelor parties, we have seen it all. In fact, we, we really uh, had a culmination, uh, the icing on the cake uh, this past week, a great festival here in our city. It's known as the Week of Ultra, Ultra Week. Um, I came home to my house to discover 12 fairies on the sidewalk. You haven't lived until you've been welcomed into your house by 12 fairies going, Ultra! Does the Airbnb with the fairies get the neighbor card? Because I've got to be honest with you, this is not like a new challenge for me. I grew up in the state of Washington, Tacoma, Washington, um, outside of Seattle. And for 14 years, I lived on the same block. It was Woodworth Avenue. And right next door to my house, I grew up next to my grandparents. In fact, we called them Nana and Papa. And Nana and Papa were the best neighbors you could ever imagine. Their door was always unlocked. I could always come in. Nana was always cooking up something. She was my piano teacher, and she was my best friend. But not everybody on the block was like Nana and Papa. There was this bully on the block who used to beat me up every day. Her name was Christina. <laughs> Shut up. Um... The house next door to my grandparents, this guy, his name was Jack. And Jack was one of these kind of people, I don't know if you ever met these guys that like, like their lawn, their grass is like a small idol in their life. If you touch the grass somehow, didn't matter what time of day it was, Jack would like have this internal alarm. He would come out and say, get off my grass. 14 years, every year on 4th of July, we'd shoot off bottle rockets. And every year, Jack called the police department on us. I gotta be honest with you. As a little boy, they didn't feel like my neighbors. They felt more like enemies. I grew up in church. And as we read today in Luke chapter 10 and other parts of the Bible, Jesus continually will tell us to love our neighbor. But have you ever thought to yourself, okay, I'm cool with loving Nana and Papa, but what about everybody on the block? Does Airbnb, Christina, and Jack get my love too? Jesus who exactly is my neighbor? That question is a question that's been asked for many, many years. In fact, that's the question that we're going to try to answer today. And that's what our text is talking about. Luke chapter 10 is a beautiful story where Jesus is teaching one day. In fact, he's teaching to a Jewish audience. And quickly as he's teaching, there's a man in the audience. The scripture says that he's an expert in the law. Most scholars believe that he was a lawyer. And the scripture says that he wanted to test Jesus. And so he asked Jesus a question. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this question, if you've been on this journey with us the last few weeks, is not a new question because we've seen this question asked before. Remember the story of the rich young ruler. And what we learned just three weeks ago is that the way that we perceive someone will dictate how we receive from them. Like the rich young ruler, this lawyer, he simply sees Jesus as a rabbi, just a teacher. Now, don't get me wrong, Jesus was a rabbi. But this day, Easter Sunday, is the day that we are reminded that he was so much more than a rabbi. Because last time I checked, rabbis don't die and then resurrect, but rather Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave, and therefore he is God in the flesh. Come on, take five seconds right now if you believe today in Jesus that he's God. And so 
This man asks Jesus, the rabbi, a rabbi question, so Jesus gives him a rabbi answer. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the law. Then Jesus follows up and says, how do you interpret the law? Now, I actually love what the lawyer says. The lawyer says something quite profound. He says, well, when I look at the law, I think it's summed up in two basic principles. I think it's summed up in this idea that we're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says this, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, once again, I grew up in church. And so I grew up with this premise that we are supposed to love everybody. But what I learned is that many times when Christians say we're called to love everybody, they really mean love everybody that thinks like you, acts like you, behaves like you, and looks like you. And then everybody else who falls outside of those categories, love them with the love of the Lord. And anybody who's laughing grew up in church. Because love them with the love of the Lord is Christianese for I can't stand that person. Only to be followed up by, bless her heart. <laughs> if you ever hear someone in church say, bless your heart, they're really saying, yo, you an idiot, dog. <laughs> so here's this lawyer. I think it's about loving God and loving people, loving my neighbor. And Jesus says, yes, do that and you will live. Here comes the lawyer. Look at what the text says. The text says the lawyer wanted to justify himself. See, a religious spirit is always focused on yourself. Religion always focuses on what you must do. Grace, the gospel, and a relationship with Jesus already declares he's already finished all the work. So wanting to justify himself, here's the question. Uh, but Jesus, <laughs> who exactly is my neighbor. Because I just want to make sure, if I'm going to be loving people, I want to make sure I'm not wasting time loving the wrong people. I want to make sure I know who my neighbor is, because if they're not my neighbor, I'm not going to love them. So you tell me who's my neighbor. Because I just want to know, is Christina on the block my neighbor? Is Jack my neighbor? Are the fairies in Airbnb my neighbor? Republicans my neighbor, Democrats my neighbor, are heathens my neighbor, are sinners my neighbor, are people of other religions, are they my neighbor? I just want to know who is my neighbor. Classic Jesus. You ask him a question, and he tells you a story. You ever do this? You like, you got these big deep theological questions. These cosmic conundrums. Let me just bring my pithy questions to Jesus. He's like, oh, man, let me tell you this story, dog. <laughs> he says it's like this. It's like a man who leaves Jerusalem and he's headed to Jericho. Now, quickly what we discover just reading the text is that most like this man, by all accounts, would have been a Jewish man leaving Jerusalem. He's a traveler. And he gets on this road and he's headed to, to Jericho. And as he's traveling he encounters these robbers, these thieves. Now these robbers, they come and they steal everything from this man. And then they beat the man up. In fact, they beat him up so bad that they leave him half dead on the side of the road in a ditch. He says the robbers leave, but they leave the man on his way to die. But then Jesus says this. He says, but then three different people come by and see the man lying there. He starts out by giving the first man. He says the first person to see the man on the side of the road was a priest. When the priest saw him, instead of doing anything about it, he just passed by the man. I think the priest represents that response that when we see problems, many times we go, yo, that's not my problem. And if we're not careful, like the priest, we will pass right by problems that we actually have the answer to. Isn't it funny that a priest's job is to serve people, it's to help people, yet as he sees this man who he can help, it's like he doesn't have enough time because he's thinking to himself, I didn't cause this problem, therefore it's not my problem. I don't ever want us to be a church that we just pass by problems saying, that's not my problem. Listen to me, just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it's not your problem. I don't want 
to be someone who just passes by things because I didn't cause them. But Jesus continues his story. He says, it's not just a priest who passes him by. Also, a Levite passes him by. Now, the Levite sees him in the same thing. He looks at him and just keeps on moving. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, what's a Levite? Well, a Levite is like an assistant to a priest. So I think the Levite represents that response that he saw the problem, but he might have thought to himself, oh, I'm not qualified to solve this problem. This is more like a priest problem. (laughs) You ever notice that that's what happens in church life? It always makes me laugh when I meet people and they say, I need prayer, but I got to have the senior pastor pray for me. As if the senior pastor has a direct line to heaven that other people don't. You do understand that grace is the great qualifier, that we all must start at the foot of the cross and that nobody has a better connection to heaven. But rather, wherever you're at today, the story of Easter is that Jesus came from heaven to earth and he has cleared the line. You have a direct line to heaven. You are qualified by his grace. His grace is sufficient for you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you loud and clear if you'll just call out to me. What's amazing to me about both of these first two men is both of these first two men carry a title, priest and Levite. Now, typically, a title is going to indicate what you specialize in. Let's make it more simple. A title typically indicates what you do. So think about this, like plumber... I work on pipes. Carpenter, I build stuff. Lawyer, interprets the law. Police officer, enforce the law. Chef, I make food. Politician, they always tell the truth. (laughs) What I'm getting at is that your title is attached to your task. Meaning, if you're unwilling to fulfill your task, don't carry the title. See, this is what's powerful about Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Christ is not his last name. It's not like, hey, table for two for Christ, that's not his last name. Christ means Savior. Jesus' title was, he is Savior. In order to save us, he had to die for us. This is what makes our God so unique, that he is a servant leader, that he didn't come to be served, but rather he came to serve. And he said to himself, I'm not just going to carry the title of Savior. I'm going to be willing to get up on a cross and fulfill the task. I'll give my life in order to get you back. Come on, somebody. Anybody thankful for a God who fulfills the task of his title? We got a priest. And a Levite. Their whole job is about serving people. But here's a great opportunity. Yet the problem is not theirs or they're not qualified to fulfill it. If we're not careful, we will look at our city of Miami. And as Christ follows, we will look at it and we will condemn it and we will judge it. And we will look upon the darkness of this city and we will step back and say, I didn't cause this darkness and therefore I don't have to solve this darkness. If we're not careful, we say, you know what? Somebody else will come and do this. That is not the heart of Voo Church. Voo Church understands that we are God's plan. We were put here on a mission to fulfill a task. I want us to be a church that if we're going to carry the title of Christian, it means that we're going to do the work of a believer. Since we started this church, I've always had this simple prayer. I just said, Lord, I don't want my best sermons to be preached on Sunday. See, if our preaching is better than our living, we are in trouble, yo. And so I've just just prayed from day, Lord, I want my best sermons. I I want my ministry to happen not on Sunday with this big title and a microphone. I want you to bring me opportunities that I can be light that I can help people in need wherever they're at. I want to fulfill the task. I'm telling you, you're going to walk out of this room today and there's people all around you that are broken and hurting, that are in need of hope. And if you will just simply fulfill your task, you'll be shocked to see what God will do in your life. 
a couple weeks ago, we had this event here. It's called uh, Voo Girl. It happens uh, three times a year. We gather all the women of our church. It's, 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 it's insane. It's just <laughs> girls and we love you, Jesus. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> it's a powerful night. And our church has always had this kind of little value on our team that we're going to celebrate constantly. Yeah. And the reason why is because so much work goes into putting on any service. In fact, even like today, like maybe you're just coming and you're enjoying it, but you must understand it's just we've got to make sure that we understand that people showed up at 545 in the morning out of a semi-truck and put speakers in and put lights in. People serve and people, they have a title servant leader, but they fulfill the task of being a servant leader. And so because we work so hard, we always make sure that we take time to celebrate all of the hard work. We're going to prepare together, we're going to pray together, and we're going to play together. <laughs> And so if you don't like parties, you probably won't like Voo Church because we have a mandate from heaven to throw parties with a purpose. And so after Voo Girl, after, after all the after party here happened, there was another party happening to celebrate some team that put the event together. And it's fun. Everyone's dancing. Everyone's having fun. But, like, has the party ever ended for you? And you're like, the party's over, but I still got a party on the inside of me. <laughs> Don, she's like, yo, I got a baby at home. I was like, I know, but this is Voo Girl. This is my night. What? And so Don Shree left, and I was left with about just 10 different people. And what's funny is that all 10 of these people were all very, very different people, different races, different backgrounds, different stories. The one thing that brings us together is Jesus and Voo Church. And we're like, hey, let's, let's keep the party going. And so we went over to this lounge in downtown Miami, and there's about 10 of us. We're sitting down. We're having a drink, talking, hanging out. And before you know it, we, we look over, and there's this couple that's, I don't know how to say it in a nice way, but there's like a lot of PDA happening, just a lot of French kissing and so someone from our group somehow, I don't know, gets in a conversation mid-breath, and, um, <laughs> and he's like, to the girl, he's like, oh, you're here with your boyfriend. And she's like, no, I just, I just met that guy 20 minutes ago. <laughs> but she said this to the wrong group of people. Because now we're like, no, don't do it. <laughs> no, it's not worth it. <laughs> It won't be fun in the morning. No. <laughs> and so we're trying to encourage her, you know. Well, our time there comes to an end. We go, all right. But once again, the party was over, but there was still a party on the inside of me. But where do you go on a Thursday night at 3 in the morning? Denny's. <laughs> I said, we're going to Denny's. I'm buying everybody breakfast. So all 10 of us left downtown Miami and went over here to 36th Street. It's about a 10 minute drive, kind of a bit of a distance, and we went to Denny's. Who knew on Thursday nights that Denny's was such a hot spot? We had about a 15 minute wait till finally we were seated, but the problem was is they couldn't have a table big enough for all of us, so we got split up into three different booths and we're kind of all around talking across the aisle. We're sitting down and we're getting ready to order. We've been now at Denny's for 35 to 40 minutes, and as we're getting ready to order, can you believe this? The same girl that we met at the lounge walks down the aisle. And she sees us and she says, wait a minute, <laughs> didn't I already meet you guys? To which then she sits down at one of our booths and our team starts talking to her. Five minutes later, the guy that she had met at the lounge walks in. He's very confused. Why are you sitting with these guys? I said, hey, buddy, come and sit with me for a moment. <laughs> He sits down, somehow, just through the course of talking, he overhears that we're followers of Jesus. He says, wait a minute, you guys are Christians? We said, yeah. He goes, oh, this is the worst night ever. <laughs> to which he then says, I was raised in a missionary's home in Mexico. I'm one of nine children, and at 14 years of age, I left my home because Christianity was too hard for me. I said, bro. Do you really think it's a coincidence out of all the places in Miami on a Thursday night that you would end up at my table at Denny's? I don't think so. He said, oh man, wait till my brother hears about this. Five minutes later, his brother walks in going, hey, what's going on, everybody? The brother in the booth is like, bro, stop, they're Christians. The brother who's partying is like, oh, no. <laughs> he sits down. 
He says, six months ago, I was a youth pastor. But I quit my youth pastor job because I couldn't live the life of a Christian. And I said, bro, <laughs> do you really think it's a coincidence? <laughs> Out of all the places in Miami, you could end up at my table. I don't know what you've done. I don't care how big your mistake. I came with some good news. Our God loves you. And you can run all you want. But guess what? You can't hide from this God. Oh, come on, somebody. I don't want to wait for a Sunday to have a microphone in my hand to preach a sermon. I don't need a title. I got a task every single day. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise in this place. You don't need a title. You got a task. There are people every single day that you encounter in this city that are hurting, that are broken that have been wrung out from religion, that think God is mad at them, but there you are! And it's our problem to solve. And nobody else is coming. You don't need a title. You don't need to wait for Sunday to be a servant leader. That's who you are every day of the week. Sermons on Sunday are cool, but the best sermons is Monday morning when you walk into work. It's Tuesday night when you put your daughter down to sleep. It's Wednesday when you don't know how to make that business work and you say, no, I'm going to step in again. I'm going to take this opportunity to be light, to put my faith in Jesus. I want us to be a church that we don't care about titles. We realize we got a task in front of us. Jesus, who's, who's my neighbor? Well, let me tell you a story. It's like this traveler who gets beat up and left on the side of the road. And a priest walks by. A Levite walks by. And you would think, you would think that they would solve it, but, but they didn't. And then he says this. He says, but a Samaritan came by. Now, as soon as he said the word Samaritan, I want you to remember that he's speaking to an all-Jewish audience. In fact, he's speaking to a Jewish lawyer. In the moment he said the word Samaritan, every one of them would have clinched. They would have stepped back. They would have been put back a little bit. And you say, why? It's because Samaritans and Jews were enemies. In fact, Samaritans were so despised and so oppressed by Jews, they were looked down upon. And you got to understand the context of it. 900 years before this moment... Israel was subdivided into two kingdoms. It was Israel in the north and it was Judah in the south. And within some time, the Assyrians, they came and they took dominion over the northern part of Israel. And finally, Babylon came and dominated the southern part known as Judah. Well, in the northern part, what started to take place is that Assyrians and Israelis started to create families. And before you know it, the children that came from Assyrians and Jews, they were known as Samaritans. They were a mixed race. They worshipped mixed gods. They had different beliefs. They looked different. In fact, Jude Jews and Samaritans, it was classic racism. See, racism has been a problem for a very long time. And the answer to racism is always the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have to stand up. We have to shout it out. We have to call it out. Here 2,000 years ago, we see it taking place. This Jewish lawyer who knows the law, who's an expert in the law, he's going, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this whole story. And finally, he says, the priest walks by and the Levite walks by. But of all people who actually stop, it's a Samaritan. So it's a Jewish man beat up, left for dead, and it's a Samaritan, the oppressed, the one who's looked down upon, the lower class citizen, the enemy of the Jew. He's the one who stops, and the scripture says that he had pity on the man. That he doesn't stop at pity. The Bible says that he goes down and he begins to bandage the man's wounds and he cleans the man's wounds up. He takes it a step further, he puts the man on a donkey. 
He takes the donkey to an inn. There at the inn, he continues to clean the man up. As he finally finishes cleaning the man up, he pulls out two silver coins, and he pays the innkeeper two coins, and he says, hey, check this out. Uh, I'm going to leave. I'm coming back, and when I come back, please look after him. When I come back, I'll make sure that you are taken care of. I love this Samaritan because he feels the pain of this man. He focuses on the pain of this man. He funds the resources to the pain of this man. And he follows through. I hope our church is like that. I hope our church sees our city and sees our loved ones and sees our neighborhoods. And hope we feel their brokenness and their hurt. I hope that we focus on it. No, we can't do everything. But we can do something. And many of us, because we can't do everything... Somehow we think that gives us the right to do nothing. No, we focus. We fund. Maybe you're a guest here today and you say, how is all this paid for? You know how it's paid for? It's paid for by people who don't have to give, but they get to give. Say, I'm going to fund this. Healing's taking place at this end every single week, and I want to be a part of funding this. But I want us to be a church that follows through. That we don't just get excited on Easter Sunday, but we live it out every week. Jesus he finishes telling the story in classic Jesus. You ask him a question, and he asks you a question right back. Who's my neighbor? Jesus tells a story. And what does he say? Which of these three was a neighbor to the man in need? Watch the lawyer. The lawyer is obviously convicted. He's obviously being challenged to his core. In fact, he can't even get the word Samaritan out of his mouth. He goes, I suppose it's the man who showed mercy. And Jesus says, yes, go and do likewise. Whew. Funny, right? We asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't answer. Instead, he gives us a picture of what a good neighbor looks like. I think many times I'm asking the wrong question. I'm saying, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus is saying, Rich, are you a good neighbor? Isn't it amazing that when you actually start to build a relationship with somebody, you start to get more of the story? Our church is not so nearsighted that all we look at is an Instagram image or all we get is a headline and think we can judge people based on headlines. No, you sit down and you start to gather somebody's story and what you find out is, wow, I didn't have all the facts. I didn't know all this stuff. Now I know why you do what you do. You're broken, you're hurting, and therefore, that's all you know to do. You know what's funny? Going back to my neighborhood as a child, that girl Christina, the bully on the block, you know what I found out when I got older is that she grew up in a dysfunctional home. Her dad was hard on her that, that neighbor Jack who called the cops on us every year it, it wasn't that he was calling the cops on us I found out later on that he had this chronic hearing problem that 24 hours a day 7 days a week he had this high pitch hearing noise that would just go off in his ears and any extra noise would create chronic pain and shrieks of pain down his spinal cord he wasn't calling the police because he was mad at us he was calling the police for help you know what they needed? They needed a good neighbor. They needed somebody who would say, welcome to the neighborhood. You're welcome here. You belong here. You know what Miami needs? Miami needs a church that would say, you're welcome here. Welcome to the neighbor. Welcome to the community. Welcome to VU. What's amazing, and I could close, but it wouldn't do it justice because it's Easter Sunday. And as we've been learning for the last five weeks, Jesus tells these stories not so that we can just be inspired and have some aspirational parable that we could go out and do better and be gooder. Gooder's not a word, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, he tells these stories because he wants to drive you to the end of yourself. You see, when he looks back at this lawyer and he says, hey, man, you want to know how you inherit eternal life? Keep the law. 
How do you interpret the law? And the lawyer's like, well, I think it's about loving God and loving people. He's like, you've judged correctly. And the lawyer's like, but who's my neighbor? He's like, well, let me tell you who your neighbor is. And he goes through all of these things, and then he gives a picture of an enemy who served the man all the way to the point that he paid for all of his help. This lawyer is going, I can't do that. I can't even say the word Samaritan, let alone love him like that. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is trying to get all of us to realize that none of us, here's me, hand up, none of us are the good neighbor. I am not the good Samaritan in this story. No. I'm the traveler on the road. I'm not the good Samaritan. Jesus is. This man would have heard this story and said, yo, what you're talking about is impossible. Love like that is radical. I can't do that. And Jesus is like, I know you can't, but I can. Yeah. But I can. Oh, friend, let me encourage you for a moment on Easter Sunday. You and I were the travelers. And we entered into this world and this world ate us up, chewed us up, spit us out, and left us for dead. Sin, the scripture says, left me for dead. I was dead in my sin. A dead man can do nothing. That's who I am. I'm on the side of the road dead. And religion, it passed me by. Self-help passed me by. None of that stuff could save me. None of that stuff could aid me. None of that stuff could clean me up from the inside out. But there was this good Samaritan. His name is Jesus. And he saw me in my place of brokenness, shame, and pain. And Jesus, like the Samaritan, was moved to compassion. He felt, the Bible says he's close to the brokenhearted. He came and he cleaned me up. He picked me up. He put me on a donkey. He took me to an inn where he continued to serve me. He pulled out the money from his billfold and he said, I'll pay two silver coins. It was a cross on Friday. It was a tomb on Saturday. But he said, I'm going to come back on the third day and it's a Sunday and I will pay the full ransom. An enemy of God, Romans 5 tells me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. When I could do nothing for God, Jesus, the good Samaritan, the one I rejected, the one I betrayed, he came and he found me in my pain. And he picked me up. And he bandaged my wounds. And he said, one day I'm coming back for you. But while he was serving me, he said, welcome to the neighborhood. Yeah. Welcome to the neighborhood. You know what my favorite part in that story is? This is for our church. We're the traveler. Jesus is the Samaritan. But you know what Vu is? Vu is the inn. I don't know if you grew up in church, and I don't know if you even understand this church stuff, but let me just describe it to you in a really, really simple way. What is vu? Vu is an inn. An inn? Yeah, this is a safe place for anybody who has been broken by this world, who's hurt by sin. I say we bring them all in. I say we bring them into the inn. And like in the Good Samaritan story, we serve them until Jesus comes back. Vu Church, we're the inn that constantly says, welcome to the neighborhood. You are a child of God. Come on, Vu Church, with your hands lifted. Come on, with your voice raised.